Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program, Hillel at FIU, and the Jewish Museum of Florida at FIU, it's my honor to welcome you to FIU's seventh annual Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week. I'm John Stewart, Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Architecture and Associate Dean for Cultural and Community Engagement in FIU's College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts. And we have been proud to be associated with Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week for many years. Before I introduce our speakers tonight, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our co-sponsors, the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU, the SOA Miami Beach Urban Studios, and the Wilsonian FIU. We are grateful for your contributions and to participation in this event. And now allow me to introduce our panelists in the order of their appearance. First, you'll see curator Kira Schuster, who joined the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a staff member in 1994. Her primary role is acquiring new materials for the permanent collection. She was a key member of the curatorial team that created the museum's uh, exhibition, The Nuremberg Trials, What is Justice? An exhibit which was on view at the museum from 2005 to 2015. And I see Kira now. Um, she served as exhi exhibition coordinator for several other exhibitions and has been a featured guest on the museum's Facebook Live series. Representing both the museum and the United States, Kira has presented at multiple international conferences on Holocaust art. She appeared in the National Geographic Channel's Emmy-nominated documentary about the 350 American POWs sent to Berga concentration camp and was a featured speaker during the museum's 20th anniversary commemorative national tour. Next, after Kira, we'll, we'll hear from Lori, Lori Arbell. Lori is a Florida-born artist, light worker, and creative life coach guiding young adults through personal journeys of self-discovery and often the discovery of their own creative talents. And I see Lori there too. Um, her passion to create innovative mixed media art and photography and to help others bring out their own inner artists has led her to teach in New York City and South Florida schools and community spaces for 18 years. Whether finding her own inner expression in art or helping students to do the same, she always, try, she always tries to offer a positive, energetic perspective. Lori has been pursuing, pursuing her own artistic muse since early childhood. Later in life, she discovered that artistic expression could be a tool to heal. In college, using art to work through the anger and pain of her mom's death. Later on, after a difficult birth, she used art to sort through the emotional challenges and creative shutdown that followed. It was then that she was affected most profoundly by its healing power. And it was then that she started teaching others how art could be used for healing in stressful situations and how it can actually promote inner happiness and well-being. So it's nice to see you all. And we'll uh, finish with the, our, our last speaker will be Dr. Oren Baruch Steer, who's director of the FAU Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program and professor of religious studies in the Stephen, Gray, Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, where he also directs the Jewish Studies Certificate Program. Dr. Steer is the author or co-author of three books. His research addresses Holocaust testimony, Jewish memory, Holocaust education, and the material and visual culture of the Shoah and its remembrance. Steer teaches and lectures widely on the memory and representation of the Shoah, as well as on issues in religion and violence in contemporary Jewish studies. And he co-organizes FIU's annual Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week. And for this, we thank you. Thank you, Warren. So with this, I'm going to hand, hand the spotlight over to someone who is used to having the spotlight and who appreciates it, uh, Kira Schuster. So Kira, take it away, and I will uh, take myself off the wheel. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, let me, I know, as I always says, let me share my screen. So hopefully this will work and everyone will see what they are supposed to. Um, so that's great. So thank you, uh, John. Um, as mentioned, I am Kira Schuster, and I use she, her pronouns, and I have been with the museum for about 27 years now. And as an acquisitions curator, my primary responsibility is to identify and acquire new materials for the museum's permanent collection. Um, the museum continues to actively seek and collect original artifacts, documents, photos, films, 
primarily from the time period of Nazi occupation through life in the displaced persons camps in order for us to tell the tragic story of the Holocaust powerfully and authentically. In addition, we also collect books, unpublished memoirs, home movies, oral testimonies, music, recorded sound, artwork, uh, you name it, you can think of it. I'm sure we have acquired it or been offered it. And uh, we collect from all victims of Nazi persecution, regardless of race, religion, political beliefs, ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera. And we also collect material relating to Americans and the Holocaust, what was happening on the home front, and materials from and documenting witnesses, bystanders, and even the perpetrators themselves. The majority of the collections we find um, are really because people have reached out to us. Um, in pre-pandemic times, we regularly travel domestically. I'm actually from South Florida, uh, born and raised, and so I often get to come down there for trips. Uh, we also have staff that are based internationally. And an, an important part of our process is uh, not just collecting all of these things, but researching the individuals or the communities that the collections originally belong to. And when we're able to, we will write a family history or a brief biography um, and attach that um, to the catalog record so that people can see and learn about that personal history because preserving that is equally as important to us as the preservation of the physical material. Uh, once the material is accessioned into our permanent collection, then it's ready for cataloging and imaging, and eventually you will find them in our online catalog, which, there we go. Um, it was something that I'm regularly asked about is, you know, where is all this material? You're bringing in all these things. Um, and actually only about one to 2% of our collection is physically on display at the museum at any given time. Uh, the rest is at our offsite Chappelle Family Collections and Conservation Center, which you see here. And this facility is also going to be our primary research center for the museum uh, and will eventually uh, become our primary location of our library. Uh, anyone has been to the museum right now, our library is on the fifth floor of the building, but it's moving out to the Chappelle Center. So it's a one-stop shop for, for research and reference. Um, my colleagues and I are regularly speaking with and meeting with people in order to identify and acquire new materials. Uh, we're always looking to connect the dots and learn more so that we can expand our knowledge about the Holocaust. You know, I always say what you think you know is probably just the tip of the iceberg, if even that. Um, one question I also get asked quite often, especially since the pandemic began, is, um, is the museum still collecting? And the answer to that is very much a resounding yes. Um, although we were and still are, unfortunately, primarily telecommuting um, since March 2020, my colleagues and I have continued to receive a huge number of emails and phone calls from individuals and families, not only across the United States, but North America and even, you know, in Europe and Israel, uh, from people who would like to contribute their materials to the museum's collection. Prior to the pandemic, we would receive on average one to two new collections a day, and that's calendar days, not business days. Um, and so far, we have agreed to accept uh, hundreds, about almost 500 new collections as soon as we are able to physically receive all of them. And since we are unable to travel or meet with people face to face, uh, we've adjusted our methods. We've been meeting with people over Zoom or phone, video conferencing. And in fact, our oral history department has continued to record new interviews um, domestically and internationally. And they actually really have enjoyed the flexibility of using Zoom to do this because it's allowed them to record longer, more detailed interviews at the safe not only safety level, but the comfort, physical comfort of the interviewees, uh, and they don't have to worry about the time clock of a, you know, contracted film crew or anything like that. Um, of course, there are cases where our own research leads us to the collections. Um, and in 2005, I, since 2005, I have been doing research on the Burga concentration camp. And this is, a, as mentioned before, it was a documentary I was involved with, but this is a camp that was a subcamp of Buchenwald, and where 350 American prisoners of war were sent by the Germans as slave laborers. And when I first learned about them, it was because I had started doing research on American citizens who were victims of the Holocaust. Granted, this is a very you know, smaller group of people and the large majority of victims, but an important group to document nonetheless. And in 2008, I saw an interview on CNN with a gentleman named Anthony, Tony, as I call him, Acevedo, um, who was interviewed. And he was a Mexican-American Catholic. And the story headline was, 
I survived Buchenwald. So of course I had to reach out to him uh, and thus become a lifelong friendship with us. Um, these 350 men were among the tens of thousands who were captured during the Battle of the Bulge. They were initially uh, all captured late 1944, mostly around December, uh, and sent to Stalag 9B prisoner of war camp in Bad Orb, Germany. Now, upon arrival, the POWs were asked name, rank, serial number, and religion, which of course was not something that they were supposed to be asked, and not all of them were. Um, many of the Americans initially resisted providing the Germans with this information. Some of the Jewish soldiers even, you know, tossed their dog tags or buried them in the snow because their dog tags did identify their religion. Now, in late January of 1945, the Germans went through the troops at the POW camp and separated out all the Jewish American soldiers, which were about 70 or 80, and placed them in separate barracks. Now, Sidney Goodman, who was one of the Jewish GIs whose photo you see here, kept a diary on the back of family photos that his wife had sent him from home. He wrote about the segregation of the Jewish soldiers and even the rumor that some of the non-Jewish soldiers felt that this was unfair and the Jewish GIs were getting preferential treatment. Now, this of course was untrue. At the time being, treatment was equal for everyone across the board. In orders came down in about Feb early February 1945, that 350 of the POWs were needed for forced labor. We don't know exactly who placed those orders, we just know that they were issued to camp. And so on February 8th, all of the Americans were called out of their barracks, and again, all of the Jewish soldiers were ordered to identify themselves. The Germans then went down the lines and they pulled out any men who they felt looked Jewish, whose names sounded Jewish, uh, they pulled out all the Catholic soldiers, um, anyone who they decided was undesirable or a troublemaker, um, which is how Tony Acevedo was selected. He was one of at least three Mexican-Americans selected in this group, and my research has discovered there was at least one Native American selected in this group as well. And once the Germans had identified their 350, those troops were marched to the train station, they were loaded onto boxcars, and after a six day journey with no food or water, the train finally arrived in the town of Berga under Elster, where they were marched to the subcamp of Buchenwald. And I should add, contrary to popular belief, the majority of these men were not Jewish. So the Americans arrived February 13th. Um, the majority of these soldiers were placed on forced labor details with the political prisoners of the Burgo One camp, which was across the road. Uh, and they were all together digging out these underground tunnels in 12 hour shifts. Uh, men like Tony, who were medics, were not required to work in the tunnels, but instead they were in charge of picking up their food rations from Burga One um, and retrieve any soldiers who had fallen out or died. Uh, they cared for them as best they could with little to no medical supplies. Um, Tony once told me he was lucky if he had water um, and they were in charge of burying the dead. So the Red Cross armband that you see here, along with Tony's handsome photograph uh, and his um, was worn by Tony into camp. And you can see, if you could see the signatures on there, those are signatures of the fellow medics who were in the camp with him. As prisoners of war, the men were entitled to receive care packages from the International Red Cross. Uh, however, at Berga, those packages were often withheld from the Americans. They were actually only distributed once. Uh, they contained food, cigarettes, uh, some supplies, and in some cases, journals. And Tony was lucky enough to receive two journals in his care package, so he kept one for himself that you see here and gave the other to his friend Steven Schweitzer from New York. And Tony became so concerned that no one would ever know what had happened to them. So while their families probably at this point had been notified by telegram that they were either missing in action or prisoners of war, they certainly had no idea that they had been sent to Burga. And when I first asked Tony why did he feel compelled to keep this list? Because it was super dangerous for him to do so, you know, to keep this diary. Um, he was keeping a list that you, the list you see here of names were prisoners that had died or that he gave medical treatment to in the camp. And he told me that it was his, and I quote, his moral obligation to do so. So by keeping the diary and recording this list of names, at least there would be some written record there uh, that existed if he were not to survive that these men were in this camp. Now on, going back, sorry, on April 3rd, 1945, the Germans evacuated the camp. Um, the Americans were sent on a forced march, a death march, south towards Czechoslovakia, 
in order to stay ahead of the Allied troops that were quickly approaching. And at this point, there were only about 280 Americans in the camp. Uh, some men did escape successfully, others succumbed to injury or died or were killed. Um, and finally, on April 23rd, the remaining GIs were liberated by the US Army's 11th Armored Division. And the majority of the men who survived never publicly talked about their experiences. And Tony very generously in 2010 agreed to donate his diary and his armband and other materials to the museum so that others could learn what had happened to them. We, this was the first time that the museum had physical evidence of what happened in this camp. Uh, prior to Tony's donation, we only had some oral history interviews that some of the survivors had made. And publicities from Tony's donation led to other Berga families and survivors come, to come forward and donate their materials as well. I have been working very diligently over the past few years to accurately identify every single man and his individual fate, because this has never been recorded. And most importantly, the research that I've done uh, combined with, you know, from the museum's holdings and that of other archives and all the testimonies we've acquired have helped me provide some of these families with physical evidence about what happened to these men or their loved ones. And we have intentionally cataloged these collections and these artifacts to make sure to include the individual names of the GIs so that as a, you know, when people are looking for information, they will find them online and they will reach out to us. So another collection that has resulted in multiple dots being connected is a short three minute film clip that documents the liberation of the Butel internment camp in France. And this collection story belong, starts the way most do these days with a Google search. Uh, here you can see uh, on the map uh, where VTEL is located in France. And this handsome gentleman is Eldon, Private First Class Eldon Nicholas. He was an ambulance driver with the US Army's 548th Medical Ambulance Company. And they were part of the troops that arrived in VTEL immediately after the camp was liberated. Eldon, like many you know, veterans of World War II, never really spoke much about his experiences during the war. Um, he passed away, I believe, in the 90s, if I'm remembering correctly. And in 2008, Eldon's son, Donald, really was at a point where he wanted to know exactly what had happened with his dad or where his dad was. He wanted to learn more. So he took to Google, typed in VTEL, typed in names of some of the other places that appeared in dad's war things. And this is what he found, right? So the first thing that he came up was a catalog record for on our website for March of Time newsreel outtakes, which documented VTEL after liberation. The camp primarily held foreign nationals who the Germans were planning to use for civilian prisoner exchanges. And so while the internees of VTEL did not have to perform forced labor, there was one transport from the camp to Auschwitz. So Donald sat down at his computer, he's reading about VTEL on our website, and he starts to watch the newsreel footage. And about two minutes into the film, he sees the following uh, clip and it is silent, there's no audio. So hopefully it will play and I will talk over it. Um, and it's not playing. Ah, I apologize for the technical difficulty, but let's imagine that it is playing and I'll tell you what happens. Um, so what he sees is a large crowd of women and, oh, there we go, okay a large crowd of women and children, and they're watching in delight as this American soldier is playing with the puppet. And the children are smiling and they're laughing and they've got like the cutest smiles and punums that you could ever imagine. They're trying to grab the puppet. And then in the next shot, you see uh, all the children uh, on his Jeep and they're surrounding him in a mountain, a mountain of happy children, essentially. And he realized very, very quickly that this was his father. And he completely freaks out, which I can only imagine what his reaction was. Um, and he didn't tell his wife. He didn't tell his mother. He didn't tell his brother. He told nobody. Um, he called us about 24 hours later after sitting with all of this. And I was immediately put in touch with him. So of course, when we spoke, I said, so what about the puppet? <laughs> Because, you know, I'm a curator, I have to ask these things. And he says, oh yeah, that ratty old thing, it's still in dad's army trunk somewhere. And I asked if he would consider donating it. And he asked if I would send him the film footage because you really wanted to surprise the family uh, on Christmas Eve. So I sent him the DVD and of course I couldn't wait to find out, but yes, he did in fact surprise the family. 
they were all as completely flipped out as he was. It really had a lot of meaning to them. And six months later, on Memorial Day weekend, Don and his brother Greg, along with their wives and their children, came to the museum to donate the puppet that you see here. Uh, it says Kiki on her tummy, so that's what we call her. Uh, and on the back of the puppet, it says USA Internment Camp France Vitel, and the date September 14th, 1944. Um, the collection also included letters he wrote home, newspaper clippings that uh, his mother had saved. And so I love this letter because it says that there was all this excitement with a war correspondent. His parents will know it when they see it. Um, and this collection is really an excellent example of good provenance. We know the history of this object. We know Eldon used this puppet in Vitell. It's in the film, it's in the letters, it's in his photographs. But because he never spoke about it with his family, we have no idea who made the puppet, whose initials are written on it, how did he come to acquire it? Where did he pick it up? Where did it come from? And so this is why we always encourage people to document this information while they are still able to do so. We certainly understand that parting with such precious family materials is a very emotional decision, or it certainly can be. And it's not always an easy one. Um, but we regularly encourage people to document their information so that when the time comes that they are no longer able to tell their own story, that this information will have been captured and recorded for posterity. Now, what's incredible about this puppet is that the story has not ended. Um, four years after that donation was made, um, the museum celebrated our 20th anniversary. We went on a national tour. And during one of our tour stops, actually in South Florida, I met a lovely woman named Edie Frankel. Edie was a child survivor of multiple camps in the Netherlands and France. She was only six weeks old, if you could imagine that, when her family was denounced and sent to the Westerbork camp. And from there, because Edie's mother, Helen, was an American citizen, the family was sent to Vitel where they were liberated. So, of course, I tell her about Eldon and the puppet. Um, we sat down at her computer and I pulled up our website and I pulled up the clip. And the photo that you see here, this newspaper clipping, is actually the earliest photo Edie has of herself. But this was taken already on her third birthday in the United States. So as soon as I pulled up the film clip and I see this child with the blonde hair at the front of the crowd, I'm like, Edie, that kid kind of has a very similar hairdo. But I also recognize that that was very much the fashion at the time. Um, and of course, in the next shot, as soon as the camera turns and you can see the faces of the children, I immediately screamed, oh my God, that's you. And she immediately screamed at the same time, oh my God, that's my mother. Um, in the next shot of the film, you see her sister, Hannah, who you see here. And needless to say, there were a lot of very excited phone calls that happened after that. I still remember driving home from her house thinking, we have got to get these people together. Um, so a few months later, when our tour returned to Washington, D.C., uh, we did have a reunion. Here you see uh, Greg and Donald, who are Eldon's sons, with Edie and Kiki, uh, and all of their families came. It was a huge family. And uh, what's amazing to me is they said to me at the time, uh, our families have now doubled in size, and it's been years, and they all still keep in touch with each other, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So when I think of the museum's collections. I think of them as a jigsaw puzzle that has no border. So each piece of new information, whether that's a single item, whether that's uh, a lot of items, you know, every single piece of the puzzle, you know, attaches to help us learn more about what, you know, what occurred, if it could be the same family, the same camp, the same ghetto or experience or whatever. Um, and so it really helps to add to that larger picture. And we never know when the next collection is going to come. Uh, we never know what it will tell us, how it will help us learn, and it, it, or how it will help us help educate somebody about their own history. So to be able to reconnect someone with a piece of their own past is really amazing. To be entrusted to care for a family member's materials and their own personal history is also an incredibly awesome responsibility and one that we are so, so grateful to get to have. So I thank you for your time this evening. And with that, I am now going to turn it over to Lori so she can talk about the wonderful work that she does. So thank you. Wow, Kira. I was just so inspired by all those stories, all those connections. 
um, as a teacher, I can't help but connect to you, the way you spoke and your stories and putting all the pieces together. And so thank you for allowing me to share my story as an artist, as a teacher. And I want to share my story kind of like a journal, right? I'm here to talk to you today about a beautiful project I've created, um, Marks for Their Lives, but in fact, it didn't start this year, <laughs> right? It started years ago. And so right now I wanted to start with where it started. When I was in high school, back in 1998, I went on the March of the Living. And this is what I remember. I remember it being very heavy, very deep. And I remember learning about many stories and the poem, The Last Butterfly. And that, oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, ooh, that's weird. Something showed up on my screen. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Um, the Last Butterfly. And I remember being in Poland and seeing so much. And so when I came back from this March, when I was in high school, I moved on to college and we had to do a um, project. And I was still deeply affected by this story of the Holocaust. So I decided to punch out these little, like a whole puncher butterflies. I attempted, I thought I had punched out a million. I thought it was a million children who passed away, who lost their lives in the Holocaust. So I punched out a million butterflies. And then I recreated the Terezin concentration camp. There was a beautiful book with all the works saved from there. I recreated it larger than life as shown in this picture with the yellow butterfly. Um, and then I did an installation piece where I took the butterflies and I wore a white dress. And my friend who had gone with me on the trip to Poland, she on a microphone read names of children whose lives were taken while I took the butterflies and I put them into a proper burial where I covered them. Um, I learned that the concentration camp was created at, to trick, you know, the world and the Red Cross that everything was okay. And that was very um, disturbing to me. Um, I also found it interesting, the, the gentleman who wrote the poem, The Butterfly, was born on June 4th, which was my mom's birthday. Um, he was 18, I was 18, and he was from Prague, and my family's from Prague. And so often people ask me, Lori, why are you, yes, you're Jewish, and you talk about the Holocaust, but why, why are you so into this? Like, you, you must have um, a Holocaust family member or someone from the Holocaust, like directly? No, I don't. Um, just my Jewish heritage connects me so deeply. And I think these little, these little details is what connects us. And so I like to make connections. <laughs> but after I did that project, I couldn't talk about it anymore. It was very hard. And I subconsciously closed the door. And I, I was looking for other stories. I couldn't talk about that story. So I needed to find other people's stories. I loved hearing the stories. And so in college, I became a photojournalist. I was also in fine art school as well. And so I began listening and photographing to other stories. I, um, I met Stanley and Nong and I um, traveled the world um, as a photographer. I documented stories of families affected by AIDS. And um, my ex-husband at the time helped to document that. And then I went on semester at sea and I traveled the world by ship. And there I realized, so I was photojournalist, which is just kind of like a fly on the wall. But then I was taking fine art classes. I ended up combining them. On the trip, um, when I traveled around the world, I realized it was the connection between you and I that I was documenting. That was the art part. Yet it was a documentary piece because our story is a real story that should be documented. Um, so these are just little vignettes I'm sharing. <laughs> so, so flash forward, um, after I left college, I began um, teaching. And later I ended up working at a Jewish day school, David Poshnak Jewish day school. And while I was there, 
there was Holocaust Memorial Day and we had some stuff, but I realized there was nothing in the existing Jewish curriculum for art class since I was their art teacher. There was no Holocaust piece. And so in my head and my heart, I'm like, Lori, it's time. You have to share what you went on the March of the Living and you have to sh share your story as part of the bigger story. Um, and so that yellow butterfly, that last butterfly, I decided to use that poem. I shared it with the children. I taught high school and middle school and we all made butterflies, different butterflies, but we used yellow because it was you know, a very important piece. Then I realized, wow, <laughs> one piece I made, 1.5 million children I learned. That's 15 stadiums full, every seat taken full of children, 15 of them, all of those children lost their lives. That's a big deal. <laughs> That's bigger than making one little art project and then you know, moving on. Um, so I created a new project and this was called Blanket in the Sky. And it involved the whole high school and all the middle school. And on Remembrance Day, some elementary um, classes came through. And so what our goal was, was to hole punch 1.5 million butterflies, each butterfly honoring these little, little beauties who lost their lives and saying, we love you, we're thinking of you. Um, I don't remember right now, it's been like five years. We got up to like 14,000. If you want to, you can read in the, in the Florida Jewish Journal, the article was written up. Um, we got a lot of butterflies. And the girl in the middle who, whose hair is down, she ended up going home at night on her own time. We put her name is in the paper. She did uh, many thousands of butterflies herself. And um, then we ended up putting them all together and we created this beautiful blank in the sky, kind of like our little angels. And then it was part of a big um, other art show that we had. So then I retired as a full-time teaching artist at school. I decided that um, what I really wished for back in college was to have the studio in my home. Students come to my house as a, after school and I'm the teaching artist. And so that's what I'm doing right now, a practicing artist. I work from home. And when I left teaching full time, I was in a darker place. I was making sense of where I should go, like spiritually, there's other things happening in my life. Um, and so I started with this piece called Order. And since I was in a darker place, um, I just started making these relaxing lines and I found it very therapeutic. As I was making those lines, some darkness came out. Those lines reminded me of all the numbers from when I was on the March of the Living and the Holocaust and seeing that, you know, remembering the hair pulling, remembering going into Auschwitz, into the gas chambers and seeing the marks on the wall, I remembered very clearly. So it allowed me to relax yet reflect on past stories and honor, you know, truth in a safe place. But what I noticed, um, and I wanna add, I'm also, my background is in photojournalism, I told you, graphic design, photography, gridding. So composition is very um, natural to me. So this next body of work, I created 29 pieces. It took two and a half years. I didn't think about them. They were done intuitively which means very organically. I would move the paper, move it around. I didn't think about composition. And when I was done, it's like, whoa, what happened here? Wow, this is called order. We're talking like Holocaust organization, feeling boxed in, lack of identity. I was learning who I was again, but I always put the gold. The gold, you see, that sun was hope. I'm, I've, since I was a little girl, even in darkness, I always point um, towards the sun, hope. So, um, right, so with a the negative, there's still positive to look towards. Um, and so I'll read the poem that I made. While I was making these pieces, I wrote poetry as well. So this one, order, controlled chaos, 
parallel lines, parallel lives, accounted for, forgotten, numbers, hair pulling, marks, holocaust, communism, emptiness, loss, numbers, not individuals, side by side, order, courage, hope. I remember my high school Jewish day school teacher always talked about the gestalt. And um, that comes to mind when I think about this and kind of like, um, I am a micro of the macro, right? These words were mine that I felt personally, but it was something much bigger. And so I find that interesting. Um, so just going back, you see that at the bottom, you see those are part of my big series that I made. But towards the middle end, I found myself being conscious of these lines, like who? And during this time, these lines were conscious and then what happened? Um, the MSD, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting happened during the middle of my, this body of work, two and a half years. I taught at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas 20 years ago. That was the first year I taught and that's where I'm from, I'm from Parkland. So this was a really tragic, big deal. Um, to keep it short, I just started making these lines and 17 of the lines were dedicated in my mind and heart to the children and the gentleman who passed away. And then I realized I was making another piece um, and I counted Treblinka. All of a sudden I'm just counting, thinking of Treblinka. And so that piece is called 1111 or whatever number it was, I don't remember. Um, I started counting the lines. And then I realized I'm doing something. It happened organically. I'm honoring again, the children whose lives were lost in the Holocaust. Um, and I get sidetracked because that's just how my brain works. Like I'm constantly making different connections. <laughs> these ones, these marks are lines, right? But they're not just lines. There's so much more. There's, it's like a hidden meeting, right? Um, one is often seen, if you look up numerology, of spiritual awakening and guiding you to higher destiny. I keep seeing this. I was born in November, which is 1-1. My birthday is the 29th. Nine plus two is 11, one, one. I live on 110th right now. And where I grew up is 110th. So it's not random, right? This is part of my life. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. So the MSD shooting happened. They created the young women, the children, the, the students created a markup march for their lives. And I heard that, it's like march for their lives. I went on March of the Living. What about marks for their lives, right? Honoring all these stories, right? All these stories, we are one for one story. It's not that story and then that story. These are all our collective stories, right? So I called the project Marks for Their Lives. <laughs> so where's the four? Well, we're in the fourth generation right now. My children are the fourth generation from the Holocaust survivor. So that's the fourth. Um, so Eagles Haven, the shooting happened. And so I volunteered for Eagles Haven, which is a, a free community center. It was created so the community could come uh, relaxed, feel safe, make art, do drumming. Um, it was open to the whole community. And I decided this project that I'm slowly been starting making these marks, honoring the victims who've lost their lives, but also celebrating our life would be a powerful project to do with them. So I brought it to Eagles Haven. I didn't tell them it was for the Holocaust. This was not my place to share uh, my little personal private you know, passion project, but I knew that this project was very meaningful to honor our life and honor the ones who lost. So I made the project and you see them on the left. These are some of the projects that they did while we were there. But the strangest thing happened. In the middle, I felt like I could share where the project came from, the roots. Yes, it was to honor the MSD, but it also was to honor other children. And so I shared it with them. 
And all at once, I said, if you'd like to make another piece and give it to us for the traveling exhibit, I, we, I would love to have yours. And everybody at that point, and they weren't Jewish, nobody at the seat happened to be Jewish. Um, everybody stopped what they were doing and handed me their art to be part of this exhibit. And at that moment, I realized, wow, yes, this, this is obviously not just a Jewish thing. This is a global you and me thing. This is a let's celebrate our lives, our differences, our similarities, so that we have tolerance and a genocide wouldn't happen again. So the project took off. It's a global art initiative worldwide. People can make marks. Um, you, let's say I'm 42. On a piece of paper, I make 42 marks. And then you mail it in and it's gonna be part of a um, art exhibit. Right now it's online. We could put the link inside uh, the website if you want to participate. Um, artists are also welcome to do fine art pieces. If you just do it on a piece of paper, we'll get to that. So <laughs> I'm hopping around because it, it's getting exciting. Um, I happened to share the project with um, my friend, Ken, and um, she shared it with Moran from Holocaust Heroes Worldwide. She's created a beautiful organization that works with Holocaust survivors. And together we created a project, the same project, but where we work with Holocaust survivors. And Julius was one of the gentlemen who was with us. And look, what's his birth date? 101. Like there it is again, those ones and the zeros. Um, it was amazing. Um, it was very humbling because the project, when I, when I introduced it to them, the Holocaust survivors had a hard time just making a mark for each child lost in the Holocaust. They were the children. They couldn't honor just the children. They were the children. So they decided, of course, and we, we did that. I realized it was much bigger. They just, they honored any, everybody they could think of who passed away. So um, that was um, special to understand that we can't hold so strong onto, you know, control and we have to be flexible. And so we have, um, this virtual exhibit online now. You could hashtag your artwork. You could submit your artwork. It's called Marks for Their Lives. Um, the fine art submissions will be in a gallery to be announced, you know, framed and displayed. But the ones that are like simple on a piece of paper, we're going to sew them together to make a massive community quilt. And um, I also think it's special that you could do it individually. Um, here in the top corner, there's a video. You could go to our blog and you can see live videos. My dad and my son working together, intergenerational. They were just doing it to honor my mom who passed away. But then they're like, oh, why don't we celebrate this person and this person and cousin and this? So it became, it morphs into something so different for everybody. Um, Lori, you yes. are such an amazing storyteller. I could listen to you forever. We are but, done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I did not ever want this to stop. But I'm afraid we do have to go on to, to Dr. Stanton or in Steer. So yes. Uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
towards more ordinary Jews and more ordinary experiences. And that kind of coalesced for me in an interest in visual and material culture. And this led me to realize that, that Nazism itself was, was designed. Uh, it didn't happen by accident. Um, uh, there are design elements um, everywhere in the Nazi worldview, large and small, um, uh, attention to the logics of design in Nazi propaganda, the recurring symbols like swastikas and eagles, and of course, numerous images of happy, healthy Aryan folk. Um, and this really kind of got me thinking about the whole issue of, of race in Nazi Germany and the particular idea of race in Nazi Germany. Um, and, and this really led me to this opportunity to curate this exhibit. First, um, there was a 2009 Mellon Wolfsonian course in fusion grant, um, and then uh, followed three years later by an exhibition development grant. Um, I don't quite have enough time to really get into some of the challenges that were involved. Let's just suffice to say that <clears throat> there are a lot of communal and institutional sensitivities about displaying not just anti-Semitic material, which is what people normally think of when you think about an exhibit related to the Holocaust, but really uh, much more prevalent is the, the Nazi propaganda material. And how do you handle it? How do you do it uh, appropriately without creating an environment that some people might, might be concerned would actually attract the wrong kind of interest? So uh, the exhibition that I uh, had the opportunity to curate and then install in the Frost Teaching Gallery um, at the Frost Museum on FIU's main campus, uh, which at the time was uh, being used as kind of like an adjunct teaching space for the Wolfsonian. It really coalesced around two objects for me. Uh, the first was um, these uh, uh, figurines um, from Alach Porcelain that I think for me in, in many, many ways sum up the quest for purity in ordinary objects as a reflection of the Aryan ideal. Um, they're unpainted porcelain and they uh, convey uh, very simply Nazi racial purity ideas. Um, Allah porcelain was actually taken over in 1936 by the SS with the aim of producing porcelain that reflected Nazi artistic directives. Um, uh, many, uh, about half were actually uh, produced like these figurines for exhibitions and as gifts for SS officials to give to recipients. And then the, about the other half or so were purchased by the public. And of course, what we see represented here is the ideal of Hitler Youth Organization. I'm gonna come back to the importance of images of youth uh, in, in a little bit. And then the other object that really summed everything up for me in my experience with curating this exhibition was the, the people's radio receiver. Um, Nazis exploited all available means of communication in order to send their message of racial purity and national solidarity uh, out into private and public spheres alike. Um, uh, radio broadcasts brought people together, um, both at home and uh, at sporting events and other, uh, other venues. And it penetrated even into factories uh, where there was compulsory listening and even in the streets. And uh, Nazi propagandic chief Goebbels had a longstanding interest in developing a cheap mass produced radio uh, that would uh, be really in every household um, and hence the name, the people's receiver. And it's also, you know, like the people's car, right? The Volkswagen. Um, and so in this way, by 1939, German radio ownership had doubled to over 9 million sets. But what's really interesting is that this radio couldn't receive shortwave signals, which therefore prevented Germans from listening to foreign broadcasts. So uh, it was a way to make sure that Germany was united uh, with one ear, so to speak. So this, this for me coalesced a kind of uh, basic idea that I wanted to pursue in the exhibition. Here's a, a, an installation shot of 
um, kind of half of the 500 square foot gallery space. Um, and we, we really took advantage of not just Wolfsonian FIU materials, but also materials at the Mitchell Wolfson Study Center. Um, and the exhibition in this, uh, amazingly in this small space was organized around six themes. Uh, and I won't be able to go through them all today, but they were mass communication, posters, family and youth, the Autobahn, fine art, and finally, anti-Semitism. And this was really kind of an, an ongoing negotiation with the team led by John, John Mogul and Pete Clarecuzio and others who, who helped me kind of take advantage of what was available and also to try to think outside the box of what people would normally expect to, for some unexpected sorts of areas, like uh, especially the fine, art, the fine art and the Autobahn materials, I think, were the most unexpected for, for me. A big part of this was posters, as you can see from this gallery shot. Um, posters are inexpensive, they're ubiquitous, they mobilize the population uh, in service to the Nazi state, and they also really solidified what we could call a visual lexicon of the of Nazis of Nazis Nazism's racial ideology. Um, effective posters are graphics that convey a message quickly and efficiently with minimum text. And no designer was more skilled at this than Ludwig Holwein, um, several of whose posters were on view in the gallery. He was a pioneer of commercial graphic design in Germany. Um, and, uh, uh, but in 1933, he turned his talents from selling products essentially to selling Nazi ideology. And so, um, here we see the, the, the poster that I think for me really kind of uh, unifies everything that we were trying to do in the show. Um, Albert Speer, Hitler's architect, believed that radio broadcasts deprived, and I quote, 80 million people of independent thought, and it was therefore possible to subject them to the will of one man. And I think this poster uh, expresses that. Um, I, I was so struck by the way that this oversized radio kind of uh, stands in for, for the Fuhrer in this image where everybody is gathered around listening to it. Um, and, and this was also just a great triumph of, of, the, of the exhibition because uh, the poster was in such bad shape. Um, we, we really weren't even sure we'd be able uh, to, to display it. Uh, in another uh, Holwein poster, um, you can see this adaptation of the Teutonic Knight and the uh, emphasis on militarism in the Nazis' plans for aggressive territorial expansion and, and, and in the, the, the idea of the martial nature of the Aryan race. Uh, so what Holwein, I think, did here is he brings this kind of medieval warrior uh, aesthetic into the 1930s, and it's an incredibly powerful image. Um, and then uh, this is, uh, sorry, that, that first poster with the radio was not a whole vine, but this one is. Um, this is a Noise Folk, New People. Uh, it's actually a, a calendar cover. Um, and it was also the title of a popular Nazi magazine that spread the message of Nazi racial ideology, which you can see very, very clearly in, in the image. But also what struck me so much about this was the, the nature of the composition. Uh, if I were teaching this in a class, I'd ask uh, people what, what it evokes, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you, which is that, that it evokes the composition of the Holy Family, right? Um, and it really resonates, therefore, in a society where Christian belief is so prevalent. Um, on the left um, is, is uh, Peter Paul Rubens, on the right, uh, uh, Laurent de, de la Hire. Um, and, and if you put all three together, I think you can really kind of see them, uh, see this image come out clearly. Uh, of course, there are differences to be sure. Uh, most notably in the focal point of the images, a traditional holy family, the gaze is turned inwards um, at the infant Jesus, while Holwein's image features the mother and father looking outwards in opposite directions. Um, it might be a design choice. It might be kind of looking to past and future. I don't know. Um, and also the structurally, Holwein's is vertical um, and, and concentric each fitter fitting inside the other one and many, while many traditional holy families are more triangular. Now this idea of the holy family for me led to uh, uh, 
some reflection on gender roles and gender issues. Um, uh, for example, we had in the show, The Mother's Cross, which was established in 1938 to recognize exemplary mothers uh, who reinforce traditional family values. And um, I'm gonna move actually just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some discussion of that, but um, you know, it, in contrast to the emphasis on motherhood at the, as the core of the family, um, and the rewards for motherhood. Uh, there's the, the question of, of the father, where's the father? Um, <clears throat> after 1939, of course, the father is off fighting the war, but I would argue that the father is uh, also here at home in the surrogate of Hitler, looking after all the children who are, who are left behind, so to speak. Um, and for someone who did not have children of his own, um, it's amazing how many images there were put out there of Hitler with children um, we could dissect this, spend a lot of time with it, uh, um, but I think the image is, is, is very clear that what the propaganda does in terms of reinforcing that father figure image. Um, if the father is not uh, taking care of the children as a surrogate or not off fighting the war, then the father figure is, uh, is also building roads and he's building the Autobahn in particular, um, this remarkable engineering feat that was going to be a great improvement in Germans daily lives. Uh, and the propaganda apparatus of Nazism really worked to promote the Audubon uh, as well as a symbol of national identity, um, as uh, an awe-inspiring engineering feat that would stand for millennia as monuments to the technical prowess and determination of a German nation that was purified, that was revitalized by Nazi racial policies. Um, and, and it always struck me also that the cover of this pamphlet makes it look like Hitler himself is building the entire Audubon network. Uh, it also, I think the Audubon has symbolic significance related to the, the whole biological metaphor um, that, that is favored by Nazi ideologues. You might say that if the nation is the body, the roads are the arteries, right? And so here are these new fast moving arteries that are just gonna revitalize the entire German nation. I just wanna call attention in this poster, this example to the language, right? It's, it's, in, it's in English, uh, it's not in German. And that's because the Autobahn network was part of a full court press by the, by, by the German government to really promote itself as this, this, this new nation to the rest of the world. Related to the Autobahn, I was, really fascinated by the material available at the uh, study center. And one day we discovered this child's toy that I absolutely had to have in the show. Uh, it encouraged German children to put themselves in the place of these, the, the, the engineers and the builders and the travelers on the Audubon network. And the manufacturer, it has to be noted, uh, Tip and Company, was one of many Jewish owned companies that were seized by the Nazi government, uh, forcing owner Philip Ullmann to flee to England in 1933, so that by the late 1930s, the company was focusing its production on toys that glorified the Third Reich, such as government staff cars, Mercedes Fuhrer wagons, military troop transports, tanks, et cetera. Now, uh, time is late, so I'm going to skip over the section on, on fine art, and I just want to jump to the last part, which was really not the emphasis of the show, but of course it was necessary nonetheless, was the, the material on anti-Semitism. Uh, we had one uh, case in the, in, in the side of the room that emphasized, uh, that showed some of the anti-Semitic books and pamphlets that are in the Wolfsonian collection. Um, and then in what I considered to be the concluding image of the show, um, the poster for the 1937 Munich exhibition produced by propaganda ministry that, that promotes a negative image, obviously, of, of, of the Jewish race as, as the opposite, the opposite of everything else that we see as promoted in uh, Nazi ideology and Nazi propaganda, the, the complete polar opposite in appearance and in, in style and substance and everything. And, and you see there are many anti-Semitic stereotypes in this poster, the exaggerated facial features, the association with money and communism, uh, even the typeface and the color scheme, the title, of course, The Wandering Jew, 
refers to the legend uh, of the, the dating at least to the 13th century of one who had mocked Jesus on the way to the cross and was condemned to roam the earth until the final day of judgment. So although the Nazis claimed to base their racial policies on science, they were also eager to, eager to exploit anti-Semitic feelings rooted in popular Christian belief. So for me, it was an unbelievable opportunity and experience to, uh, to curate a show like this. Uh, I, I would do it again if I could. Um, and uh, it, was, it was such a rare treat to work with the Wilsonian staff and to have the chance to literally teach my class in the gallery. We, we have lectures downstairs in the frost and then come up half of the time uh, after the, the exhibit was installed and walk around the gallery and it was just such a rare thing. So I uh, encourage all my colleagues to try this sometime because it's really a wonderful opportunity. So thanks. Thank you, Oren. And I remember that exhibition very well. It was really, really stunning. I'm glad you had a picture of it in there and congratulations. I, I just, I wanna thank you and all, all three of the, um, of the panelists just for talking about um, visual materials and kind of showing us the way in which visual materials can kind of help us understand events that happened in, in the past and be evidence for um, connections that exist. They can also be, as Lori pointed out, very emotional connections and connectors to people and to um, making. And as you pointed out, Oren, they can also be evidence of, um, of, of horrific values and um, kind of help us to keep those conversations alive and understanding what this what this means and uh, what the awareness that this week means. So I just want to thank you, um, Kira, Lori, and Oren, and our sponsors at the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU, the Miami Beach Urban Studios, and the Wolfsonian FIU for this incredible discussion. I'm going to put in the chat uh, for everyone the um, the website, uh, here you go, if you wanted to get uh, have a better understanding of the events this week. And I just want to also mention that the events of uh, that the next event in the in the seventh annual Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week will be conversations at MOCA March of Survivors on Wednesday, uh, January 26th. That's tomorrow at 11 a.m. through Zoom. And you can find the full list of events in that in that link that I just sent around to everybody. And um, and um, so I hope if anybody has um, anything else they'd like to add, any panelists would like to jump in, you're welcome to. I want to thank in particular. I want to thank Luna for all of her help with this and um, for putting this all together. Thank you, Lori. So um, thank you, Kira. And Oren is, there he is. All right. So thank you everybody for joining us. It's been an amazing conversation and just the beginning of a wonderful week that uh, Oren has put together. So appreciate you guys. Have a good evening.